This was the grand stage for Destiny fans. Also, there will be a ton of loot! Ah, uh, yeah, right? That's what I thought. A time to celebrate the next great adventure in Bungie's flagship franchise, Destiny. But as the tides rose with expectations, the pressure drowned the DLC named Red War. The Destiny you cannot play. No matter how mired the game had become, there was beauty in it. This is the complicated history of Bungie's Red War, the DLC that was doomed to fail. But I hope by the end of this video that you can see, fans were filled with vexation at the potential of Bungie's largest moment in the history of the franchise. Welcome to the Red War, and please take this. You're gonna need it. This is a long video. All right, intro time. This video is very long and will cover all of the Red War, including development, campaign, endgame, and more. So I've made timestamps to chapters like all of my videos, but this one has a major overall conclusion that I think you should stick around for, or you can skip straight to it. In my opinion, it's very important. All right, back to the action. Destiny 2 had sold millions of copies, yet by December of 2017, almost all of the player base had left the game on what was Bungie's grandest moment. This might echo if you currently play Destiny 2, but in 2017, Destiny was all anyone wanted more of. And Bungie had not only guaranteed it, they had the help of two other studios and a soon to come PC port. Trailers upon trailers, all time high viewership found on Twitch streams of announcements, and view counts on trailers showed just how much people cared. So how did this empire crumble heading into the Curse of Osiris DLC? Was Red War set up and doomed to fail by decisions outside of the content itself? Hopefully by the end of this video, I can answer all of those questions. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe. And regardless, get comfy, because this is a ride like no other. This is a video of hindsight for a time where Bungie's creation of Red War could have been averted, and it all started right when this ended. Okay, being a little bit more accurate, you can assume Destiny 2 was in development way before the Age of Triumph. Uh, he's right behind me, isn't he? Oh. But promotions started in 2017, with a simple picture that swept in the masses. Then, only three days later, Bungie dropped their announcement trailer of Red War called Rally the Troops. Uh, really, guys? You may not have known at the time, but this trailer would foreshadow so much about Red War, a destroyed tower, the exaggerated tone of Cade, and the changes coming to Destiny 2 all at once. This trailer would climb to over 14 million views as of recording this video, and it's safe to say that the players just wanted more Destiny. But the largest foreshadowing would come at the end of the trailer, the name Activision and the name Bungie. The picture is tarnished now, and Bungie executives might be to blame for a lot of bad decision making, just as Activision might have been to blame for it then. But regardless, the systematic changes to Destiny's identity would have short-term gains for long-term losses. For starters, Destiny's identity was founded on loot discovery and weapon rolls, you could get lost grinding for that one role you chase to have an edge in raiding and especially PvP. This changed with the pursuit of Destiny 2's new vision, as every single role of a weapon was static, meaning that once you acquired the loot, there was no secondary journey for that one role. For some, this was a huge win, since they attributed Destiny's loot grind to some form of gambling. For others, they found the loot grind boring, and played Destiny more casually for the worlds an enticing gunplay. But for the player base welcoming in the next era of friends and family, the players who prescribed a dose of destiny, this was one of many giant mistakes in hindsight. 
It didn't matter that one change happened to Destiny here and there, as that's a part of growing and maturing your game with its player base. It mattered that the pillars of what held Destiny together were all falling like dominoes. In the coming months, players would learn that weapons would shift as well. No longer could you have a primary weapon like a hand cannon, auto rifle, or pulse rifle paired with a special weapon like a sniper, shotgun, or fusion rifle. There were no more special ammo weapons. Those weapons now became heavy weapons. You could assume how a player would feel if their favorite sniper was now competing with their favorite rocket launcher, instead of just coexisting. The plan was seen to many as Bungie making changes for the sake of balance in the Crucible. And just like the pillar of random rolls and the pillar of weapon composition both fell, abilities were up next. In Destiny 1, a super ability would come back rather fast. To some who played Crucible a lot, sometimes these would return too fast for the other team. But if you played anything else, this was never an issue. Players were also just slower in Destiny 2. Falling back to the idea that Crucible might be too chaotic with special ammo weapons. Roles that created an advantage, abilities that were too frequent, and movement that was too advantageous. This would go on to create many issues, but another major pillar was set to collapse, and that was progression. In Destiny 1, every drop was earned on a progression system of reputation gained for grinding activities. This could be your favorite faction like the Dead Orbit, or this could be from the Crucible Vendor. Either way, no matter what you were doing in the game, it was progressing some avenue for your journey of power fantasy. I can remember grinding for an Imago loop from the Undying Mind Strike, but whether I had this drop or not, it didn't matter, because I was earning reputation for my time to get an unlock of more loot and more progression towards a faction. This created a web that mandated the principle that no matter what you were grinding for, you were progressing. In Destiny 2's launch, and for a long time, tokens replaced the loot progression. As Data would go on to say in his Iron Banner token system video, don't think it's that terrible because of how close it is to faction rep from Destiny 1. It wasn't all that far off from reputation, but what it lacked was progression, a choice of the drop from vendors. And for the raid, you just got tokens out of the chest to use at a vendor, lacking the rewarding moment from your grand kill. These tokens were much like consumables that Destiny 2's launch would sneak into the game. What do I mean by this? Hawthorne had recruited us for an all-out assault on the tower, and for Amanda Holiday to work with us again, we would need to gear up for a war of thunder and attrition. If we're going to win the Red War in Destiny, we will need the historically accurate over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships of 10 major nations, ranging from biplanes and armored cars to the 1920s, to the fighter jets and main battle tanks of today with War Thunder. Have you guys seen Gaul? We will need the most powerful war machines of our time to beat him. With an unmatched wealth of high quality content to discover, there's simply no better game suited for fans of military history. Hey, look guys, you know I love history, and look, the Red War, it's totally there. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made and is available now for PC and consoles. For you, and you only, I have a link in the description of this video and the pinned comment that you should follow for a limited time, and register either with a new account or with an account that hasn't played in the last six months to receive a free bonus pack across all platforms after your next login to the game. This includes three premium vehicles depending on which country you're in. So for example, if you're in the US, you will get the exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor and 100,000 free silver, and seven days of premium account. Thanks to War Thunder for letting me talk about two wars in one video, and now back to Gaul's Red War. What do I mean by this? Well, imagine if your favorite shader was a consumable that had a limit, and you couldn't just pull it from collections of others because that didn't exist yet. You want to look good? Spin the wheel at Eververse and hope for the shader to drop. But just as the pillars of Destiny 1's identities were falling, there were some new ones slotted to create the structure of a brand new journey. For starters, Destiny 2 was all about quality of life. No longer did you have to go through a whole book of steps to get to a destination. It was 1 plus 1 equals convenience. 
This can be said for movement in the game too. No longer was sprint on a cooldown, and mantling ledges was added to the game. Mantling alone allowed for less clunky jumping sections, and a leveraged experience of Destiny's world. There were also new supers. Some of these were incredible, like Dawnblade for Warlock, a fierce hot blade of sword thrown at an enemy while flying in the air. There was also a Sentinel Titan, a Captain America shield to be tossed and bounced around any who crossed your path. Hunters ditched the Arc Blade for an Arc Staff. Everything else was pretty much the same. Titans got some movement additions with the Arc Titan Fist of Havoc, chained from a Static Slam to roaming knees to the face. Aside from those three, the other supers mostly remained the same as Destiny 1. These abilities were rare to see out in Crucible, as most matches would end due to time, and especially because most of Crucible became reliant on team shooting rather than hero moments, you didn't really get to see the supers, but when they did happen, you can bet your sweet bippy these shined. Additionally, each class had a new ability. In Destiny 1, there was nothing called a class ability. There were some hidden elements to the game like Shade Step, and if you had Titan with Twilight Garrison, you could also do in-air movement. In Destiny 2, Warlocks had the option of a healing and empowering rift both seen as questionable at the time, since they did make some activities a lot easier. Titans had a Rally Barricade, which would automatically reload their weapons, as well as a Normal Barricade, which would be an incredible use in Crucible especially, to keep enemies out of your way. Hunters had Shade Step again, but this time there was a reload version of the Shade Step to go with the regular dodge. There was a hidden element of the Shade Step, however, if you use this near an enemy, it would reload your melee for you, which was incredibly helpful for builds, especially around the Arc Staff. For a sequel to Destiny that would ditch all of the old loot, you would need to add some new tools to the mix. So Bungie added SMGs, grenade launchers, the Trace Rifle Cold Heart, and swords that were not tied to the Exotic Sword quest. There was plenty of new archetypes of weapons you know well, like hand cannons and sidearms that were pivoted from special ammo weapons to primaries, there was a linear fusion rifle that was legendary that was not named Sleeper Simulant. Oddly enough, Bungie wouldn't add machine guns back to Destiny 2 for an entire year, but with a brand new arsenal of weapons came a heap of new exotics. It's easy to forget if you play Destiny in its current state, but a lot of exotics were changed from release of Destiny 2 to now. For example, the tractor cannon was one of the most interesting concepts of a weapon, a heavy ammo shotgun with a stellar design, but its function wasn't to debuff targets, suppress them, and give you a speed boost. It was just to deal damage and push them off a ledge. In C-Day's montage of using Tractor Cannon, you can see why Bungie would go on to change this exotic. <laughs> it was a cool concept, but lacked anything other than laughing at someone falling off the map. Almost every exotic would transform in some way over the following years, and there were 19 exotic weapons added at launch of Destiny 2, so I will save you some time going through all of them and just talk about the ones that changed the most or were the most unique to Destiny 2. The dubious volley had been rumored since Destiny 1, but the Wardcliffe Coil was the official name in Destiny 2, a rocket that shot a bunch of smaller rockets. The Fighting Lion was a primary ammo grenade launcher, the Rat King was a sidearm that shot faster depending on how many rats were around. The Graviton Lance would get an audio change and a complete rework down the line, but this was pretty weak until that massive buff, which made it THE PvP weapon. Sweet Business was a chain gun that only revved up as you kept firing, making it mostly a meme, but a good one at that. Destiny 2 absolutely does not get enough credit at launch for the creativity of its exotic weapon arsenal and neither does it get enough credit for the quality of life bumps to the experience. There is a lot more that I won't speak on for too long because we will run into them in the story section of this video, but Destiny 2 wasn't a lame sequel like people would have you believe. It was a very different game than Destiny 1, but it was also pushing an unclimbable hill for one gigantic reason you might have picked up on. Every destination, every weapon, every activity, Everything from Destiny 1 was gone. And while you can make an argument that a lot of it found a way to return, building all of those pieces back would take time. We were now in a game that had some pillars built, but most had fallen for the ideals of being trendy. If you are still listening to this video, I want to make one point clear. 
Destiny 2 at launch was a great game held back by decisions that were in the vein of the ever expanding live service model. Hopefully by the end of this video, you can see the conclusion that we draw to prove this, and you can see why Destiny 2 blossomed into something beautiful one year later. For now, absorb all of that information and join me in a journey through a campaign you can no longer play. The Sunset Red War, echoed as one of Bungie's best, a blockbuster space opera with the first compelling villain since Oryx. Welcome to the Red War. As a heads up, this section will cover the entire campaign of Red War, and will include a lot of cutscenes that I've cut down slightly to preserve the important parts. Right off the bat, Destiny 2 gives us a look back if you had played Destiny 1. You could see your memories of different adventures that you had had, and also get some cosmetics for playing Destiny 1. I really like the appreciation of fan service here. And then... Ikora. What have you got? Someone or something has sabotaged the Skyline defense systems. And comms have been spotty for the last few hours. Every sensor beyond the wall has gone dark. Hmm. Maybe it's just the storm. Maybe it's... What are the subfeeds telling us? There are no satellites. And that's not good. Everyone with me, now! This is City Hawk 723. Anyone home? We're off to such an insane introduction, and man, the visuals took such a massive step up in quality. We have already established high stakes without seeing who was responsible for this attack on the tower yet. Destiny players had always wanted a true Cabal villain, and by the look of the ships, this was all a Cabal militant assault. One question I have for the retrospect's sake is, why did nobody else think to attack the tower? Has this occurred before in the tower? Leave me a comment if you know, or if I missed a lore tab along the way. Either way, I cannot compliment this prologue mission enough. It raised the bar for what Destiny's mission potential could be, and it was a museum of fan service. The mission starts off in places of the tower we have never seen before in Destiny 1, telling us that we will already be seeing more to explore in Destiny 2. The score is also brilliant again. Of course, the music department has never failed for Bungie. Right off the bat, we are in the Burning Tower, and Cade is here, in action, not standing still in a room for us just to talk to. 
We see Cade with a golden gun and Ace of Spades cooking Cabal. We then see Shaxx helping survivors of the tower with the exotic sword Raze Lighter on his back. These are characters that would normally stand still, and now they're lively and with exotics as fan service. Okay, my ghost keeps tagging these Cabal as Red Legion. Akora, what do you got? They're elite, ruthless, and rumor is they have never known defeat. Wait, where have I heard that before? I am Melania, Blade of Mikola. And I have never known defeat. Was she? Never mind. Next up was Zavala, who has my favorite interaction in the entire story with an NPC. Zavala uses his Ward of Dawn to shield you from the Cabal attack. And it's just great. All I could think of was that if this kept up, the attachment to the NPCs of the world would be so much better. After shielding off waves of Cabal, you head to the tower north and... <laughs> Speaker is gone. You will take no more from us, and you will find no mercy in me. Zavala. She'll find the speaker. We need to move on that command ship. Now head to the North Tower. I'm sending Amanda Holiday to pick you up. Finally, we head through this part of the tower. Destiny 1 players had been waiting so long to see this. Sure, it was just buildings, but you know what? I think the relief of seeing what was beyond the walls was reward enough. Amanda Holiday, rest in peace, was there to take us to the root of the issue. Zavala, picked up that guardian you never showed up about? Get him on that command ship, now! Hold on back there! Come on, big guy. Do something. <laughs> Guardian, time to kick him where it hurts. The rest of the mission was pretty neat. There was this turbine section where you needed to destroy the shields with it, and then you lose comms with everyone, which added a great atmosphere for what was coming next. How do we come back from this? You don't. Welcome to a world without light. Guardian, something's wrong. Do not look at me. You are weak, undisciplined, cowering behind walls. You're not brave. You've merely forgotten the fear of death. I was born in it, molded by it. Allow me to reacquaint you. <laughs> I never deserve the power you were given. I am Gaul, and your light is mine. In one mission, 
Gaul has become more impactful to our story than any Destiny villain since Oryx. And I would say that Gaul, at least in the game and not just in the lore, had more character going on screen than Oryx. That's going to upset a lot of people, but Oryx really just yelled at us in-game and didn't have any traits about him. Gaul, you will learn, has a lot more going on. This cutscene tells us everything we will experience in the Red War with some teases to villains we will see both years later and in the raid. We are only about 20 minutes into this campaign, and I am already hooked on whatever Destiny 2 is going to be about. The next mission might seem a little familiar if you played Bungie's Halo 3 ODST. We're lightless and barely holding on, with a ghost that can no longer resurrect us. As you walk through the streets, Journey begins to play. I can't remember a time in Destiny where there's an implied time jump like this, but apparently it has been four days on your own in the wilderness. A falcon guides your path and you find a camp where others had died before you. One major theme in Red War is death and feeling powerless without the godly light the Traveler shines on our universe. You pick up your first weapon and head through the lands to see the falcon again. There's this incredible moment as you journey through the mountains where the music hits a climax after seeing the Traveler cuffed by the Red Legion with smoke all around. Here we're also introduced to a new Cabal enemy called War Beasts, and you will see a lot of new enemies throughout this campaign. Once through, you can never make this jump, but the game tricks you into thinking that you will. I have no clue why this jump is here, but it never ceased to not annoy me. Oh look, somebody left a perfectly good guardian lying around. Things must be worse than I thought. Uh, but wait, where, where are you all going? As far away from here as possible. That falcon, it belongs to you? The name's Hawthorne, and this is Lewis, best pilot we got. What about you? Fit to fly? This would be the last time anyone would like Hawthorne. Do you see, Traveler, all that I have done? Grace me with your light. Take your place at the center of my empire. Dominus, the city is secure. Those who fled are being hunted, and those foolish enough to remain have been executed. Victory, as will all things, is yours to claim. This victory is as much yours as mine, old friend. All that remains is the completion of the cage around this great machine. Then we may begin the extraction of its power and put it to its rightful use. They call it the Traveler. I would contend that other civilizations may be more precise in their naming. Its functions can be controlled and exploited, as we have so clearly proven. Yet they believe it to be a god. Dominus. What more would the Dominus have? 
I would have words with my guest. Gaul is kinky. Coming up on the European dead zone. Gonna be our new home for a while. Look, do you recognize it? That's where we're supposed to go. That thing? They call it the Shard of the Traveler. I call it not a place you want to go poking around. Knowing a lot about Callus and hindsight of his character now versus then makes this cutscene hit a lot harder. Gaul was trained by the most greedy and corrupt ruler but his plan seemed greedy as well. Taking all of the light and forcing the traveler to give you the light. Also, I love that the console is rocking a hunter exotic on his chest. Again, it's fan service, but it's tasteful. We are now at the ultimate Destiny 2 social space that will stay here forever. And it's called the farm. This place really sucks compared to the tower, but it makes sense to suck. It's a makeshift shelter for war times and you will be here for all of Destiny 2, guys, don't worry. I swear I won't do this the whole video, but listen to the soundtrack for the farm. Here you can find all sorts of vendors, and since in Destiny 2, I believe we play as a different guardian than Destiny 1, I don't know if the NPCs forgot about Rise of Iron, because Tyra forgot who you were, and she is very much in that DLC. So we have to be playing as new guardians. The way to restore your light is to go hunting for a shard of the Traveler that fell off after the Red Legion invaded. This will be done in the European Dead Zone or the EDZ. This forest is almost never actually haunted, and nothing on the EDZ ever made me feel like it should have been abandoned. There are no real environments that make me want to stay away from this place. Yes, for the missions there's going to be some creepy caves or roads, but this idea of it being completely abandoned and haunted fell really flat for me personally. Here we are introduced to the new Fallen as well. In a stalactite cave, invisible Fallen with swords called Marauders attack. One aspect of Destiny 2 I should mention is that almost all enemy designs were changed in some way, with some being easy examples like the Shriekers now having an eye at the core of them for critical hit shots. Others are more subtle. I think this was done in an approach to be more consistent, but some enemies lost their horror factor too while others just became easier to deal with. The Fallen being a good example of this, as they felt a bit easier to hit headshots on, and they run around a whole lot less. This mission is another great entry. You are sneaking around killing Fallen in an occupied area to get your light back. You then duke it out against a group of them for the Shard of the Traveler's Light. I think we scared them away. Take me to the Shard. This is why we were led here. Hold on to your helmet. God, this is so yes, we will. Yes, we will. Yeah, hold oh, them. Some people complained back then that it only took us one mission to get our light back, but I don't know why you'd want to do a bunch of missions without your super or abilities. That seems kind of lame to me. So I was pretty happy we got it back rather quick. And what's nice about this was depending on which class you went with, the super you acquired was the brand new one, letting you go ham with Destiny 2's variety of supers. 
this is where you also begin the journey to unlock the whole subclass. It's great. This is something that I pointed out in my most recent video on the Suicide Squad. A lot of the games are missing the progression of the why, and I think Destiny 1, just like Destiny 2, both nailed this level of progression. You start off with a new toy, but you haven't fully mastered it. So until you complete your journey, you're not going to. Unfortunately, that is the last memorable mission for a while. There was so much progress made in three missions that you'd be disappointed to learn that the rest of the missions in the EDZ were just okay to boring. This next one is a great example of that. We meet with Devrim K voiced by the legendary Gideon Emery, known on this channel for being awesome and doing an intro for a video. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Thanks, Gideon. This man Devrim, however, has the no land beyond. And apparently, one shot for every friend we've lost. This mission is just a tutorial on lost sectors and adventures. New features added to Destiny 2. An adventure was practically a side mission, but sometimes they could be better than the actual missions themselves. Basically think of these as having no cutscenes or story beats, just ways to earn more gear and levels. The Lost Sectors, on the other hand, were the greatest piece of missed potential. Mini boss rooms with small gimmicks to them, but with a chest that didn't have any reason to farm them at the time, just world drop loot and tokens. I feel that these could have and still remain to have unique cosmetics, but that would become a very common trope in Destiny 2's shelf life, and one of the largest identity shifts from Destiny 1. While that game leaned into more RPG or role-playing mechanics as your hero, wearing the enemies as you defeated them, Destiny 2 leaned into a social MMO light, without retaining these features. I know, everyone becomes a critic when discussing what Destiny needs or needed, but truthfully, the RPG loot chase was one of the largest misses of the game since it debuted in 2017. By the end of the mission, you unlock the EDZ for free roaming, and this will be the flow of the Red War. Some great missions mixed in with that filler to showcase the destinations more, and teach you some new tricks to Destiny 2. It's not bad, it's more that it's necessary filler for the type of game Destiny represents. I'm not saying it couldn't be done any better, but it could have been done a lot worse, as we've seen with, with so many other live service looters that I will be covering this year. This next mission has you exploring the salt mines to plant a signal booster for Devrim to help Hawthorne in the mission Combustion, and I actually think this mission is pretty solid. Destiny is always at its best when you're in a self-contained new environment, instead of the same old open field mindless shooting. This mission has elevators that crash down, fallen hanging in the shadows, and this really neat trip mine section which reminds me of the opening of Vanilla Destiny 1's campaign. The end of the mission deals with our introduction to servitors in Destiny 2, and again, they look different. I'm not against the new design, but I do prefer the simplicity of Destiny 1's version. In Destiny 2, the servitors do shield enemies a lot more frequently, which is a nice change all around. After a battle, you take the elevator to the top of the EDZ and establish comms. Destiny players wouldn't really come back to this spot until the Thorn and Lumina quest over a year later either. So value this spot for now, because we have more cutscenes. Guardians, the city is lost. If there is any light left in the system, we rally on Titan. Be brave. Guardians. Zavala's alive! If we leave now, we can... You are not going to Titan. You don't know who you're dealing with! Don't ever tell me what I can't do, ever! This is destiny. This is destiny. This is, this is my destiny. Now, you have a choice. You can do the remaining adventures on the EDZ and rack up some XP. Learn about the... I'll take the trip to Titan. Help me understand, speaker. The light lives in all places in all things you can block it even try to trap it but the light will find its way and the traveler will protect itself the traveler for years i have studied it the world it has touched its power over life and death we are not so different. 
your traveler and I. You are nothing like the traveler. Nothing. You think you have power, control. I know your kind. You started small. You will end small. If the Traveler truly has chosen humanity of its own free will, then there is no reason I should not reach inside, tear out the light for myself, and leave this system in ashes. Only those the Traveler chooses will be reborn in the light. Yes. This I know. This is why I have claimed your planet, and why you still live. The Traveler will choose me, Speaker. And you are going to tell me how. Vanguard Fleet, Guardian Ship 723 is on approach. We received your beacon and we're ready to join the fight. Guardian Ship, this is Zavala. It's too late. The Hive have overrun Titan. I was wrong to bring us here. Destiny 2 faced a pretty tough challenge, but I think it excelled in this. How do you introduce a gripping story about one faction while still having to reacquaint players with the other factions and introduce all of these other factions to players who have never played Destiny 1? That was a rough challenge for Luke Smith's direction of Destiny 2. And while I believe the Fallen were just an okay plotline with no real driving force or central villain to represent their beliefs, the Hive on the other hand finally had another big name after Oryx's collapse in the Taken King. So, Titan is overrun, and you need to talk to a Titan named Sloan. You know, I never put that together. A Titan on Titan. One thing you should know about Titan is that while it may look outstanding, gazing upon the methane oceans where you can even catch glimpses of a leviathan creature in the water, it lacked the depth of exploration like the EDZ before it. No pun intended. But unlike the EDZ, Titan would wreck frame rates. Methane ain't cheap, I guess. You gotta pay for some frames. I can give Titan a lot of credit for its narrow traversal in comparison to the EDZ's open landscapes. This place is not for those who cannot platform around. I'm talking to you, gamer that takes two hours to clear the King's Fall ship jumping puzzle. There's some nice teases to not only the villains in this plot, but the central characters we have yet to see, like Eris. Think what spell the Hive were casting back there. We should talk to Eris more. She would know which Hive god they were communing with. No one has seen Eris, or Icona, or Cade. Since the city fell. Then the mission has you shooting, uh, egg sacks, like it's alien. By the end, you clear it out and meet our next brand new NPC. Our numbers will continue to dwindle. We can no longer protect ourselves, much less the survivors. Without the light, are we even guardians anymore? We can take care of it. Yes, I believe you can. The next mission has us getting the Rig of Titan back under control, and it's more of the same. Clear Hive and clear all of the gunk so that converters work like normal. This is where we hear the name Savathun. And don't worry, Destiny players, you would only have to wait four years after this to see Savathun for the first time. The mission ends with the power being restored. Here is a great example of Destiny 2's systematic issues, holding back an otherwise great sequel. You see, after this mission of restoring the power, Sloan just gives you the choice of three exotic armor pieces. On the surface, this is totally fine. Introduce the player to the endgame loot and let them make their own fate. The issues came from a reliance on this structure to circumvent the endgame's loot chase. The goal was to make everything in the story and strikes persuasive to partake in the newfound PvP. Simplification for the repetition of PvP's engagement. 
Again, by the end of this video, I hope you can see why I draw a conclusion. So you can choose one of three exotic pieces of armor, each equipped with the original mods of Destiny 2's armor. This was a huge point of contention not often discussed in Destiny 2's release. The mod system was just for more stats towards recovery, resilience, and mobility. Bungie wouldn't add intellect, discipline, or strength stats until Armor 2.0 two years later with Shadowkeep's release. And it's evidently clear as to why they didn't include these. They wanted the abilities to not frequent the Crucible, a focus on guns with abilities to complement. It's hard to believe, as of recording this video, in an era of Destiny 2 where the game is controlled by abilities, based around builds with little to no gunplay, but Destiny 2 had always been reacting for its changes, and whichever direction Bungie was interested in for 2017 was built around balance and gunplay. Okay, enough yapping. We have another mission to complete. This one is called Utopia, and it's back on track to the Gaul plotline. You need to track a CPU to gather Red Legion intel. This mission is fantastic only because of the twist Titan holds. As you enter Solarium and fight your way through the Fallen, you shoot some glass open to reveal an entire futuristic city, in direct contrast to the oil rig-like structures before. This is the new Pacific Arcology. Sounds like the Arcology's operating system is back online. Keep an eye out for an OS access terminal. You can use it to pinpoint the CPU network. You'd assume the science and research department of Titan would have been here. I love this space because of the direct contrast to the rest of Titan, and the almost cyberpunk-like setting with grass that is overgrown due to its abandonment. But ultimately, it falls into the same issues as the other destinations. It's a lot of beautiful sites with underutilized space, and lack of population. I loved how the halls filled with hive made them look almost like a nest of locusts. You step on the bones of others, and the shells of the hive's hatched kindlings. You fight through the hive and meet your first ogre in Destiny 2. Bungie nailed the introduction to more difficult mobs, and each mission introduces a stronger tiered enemy in each faction. In the last mission, you met a shrieker. The mission before this, you're meeting marauders and servitors. It's all in service of a strong sequel. You head through the underbelly of Titan in its arcology, and honestly, see places you won't see often outside of this mission. Tight corridors, dimly lit hallways, vents, and at the end of it all, a large open room that Professor X would be proud of. You could even see the Leviathan passing by very briefly. And if I can find that footage, I will put it here. If not, you'll just have to take my word. After picking up the CPU, Cade speaks to you as an alarm. CPU network disrupted. Well, there's no way the hive didn't hear that alarm. Got so you would do what any American would. You grab a tank and drive it out of the arcology. Once out and down the path, you can see a grassy area in the distance. If it does or doesn't look familiar, this is the entrance of the dungeon, Ghosts of the Deep. We are then introduced to the Almighty, the Death Star of Destiny 2.
the Almighty, the crown jewel of the Red Legion and life's work of their leader, Dominus Gaul. Gaul has subjugated hundreds of worlds. Those that resisted no longer exist. You see, the Almighty annihilates stars survives Gaul's ambition. What he wants is the Traveler and its light. As for the Almighty, it's now pointed at our sun. In short, sir, the war's over and we've lost. of the Traveler. When our enemies attacked, we built a wall that stood for centuries. But now walls mean nothing. This enemy has taken our home, taken our light, and now they threaten our very existence. We're going all in on this almighty. How long before the fleet's combat ready? Zavala, wait. If we wait, we die. But if we attack together, we can take back our home, our light, our hope. Or we die trying. Now, I need my fire team. I need Ikora and Cade. So just when you're getting acquainted with Titan, you're off to another moon or planet or centaur named Nessus. And unlike Titan and parts of the EDZ, I think Nessus over its time utilized its space a lot more. The EDZ felt safe, a neighbor to the Cosmodrome. Titan felt compact and claustrophobic. Nessus was almost like a combination of these. Winding roads, open waterfalls of Vex milk. Can we not call it that? Ghost says we need to pick up Cade and Ikora while Zavala prepares for the almighty assault on our sun. So we're doing a little bit of non gaul story to introduce enemy factions and get new players better acquainted with our characters. Luke deals with Cade 6 and this is either your favorite or least favorite plotline because of failsafe and Destiny 2 Cade. Cade was always the comedic relief in Destiny 1, but he found a great balance of not being too over the top. Eris, get your rock off my map. It Destiny 2 Cade makes me question all of the great stories of solo heroism and gunslinging survivability. He seems like the guy who would get himself killed, something he would do only one year later. Failsafe, I don't mind as much, as people at the time seemed to hate her. I do think she's fine and more memorable than Sloane and Devrim, even if I do have Gideon Emery bias. Failsafe is a comedic take on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, an AI with two personalities. At least Cade poked fun at a pretty laughable moment from Destiny 1. Don't ask me how this happened. I don't have time to explain what I don't have time to understand. I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. You then meet the Vex, and they look a lot less fearsome here. I wasn't a huge fan of the change in design, even if it is subtle. Failsafe explains that Cade is stuck in a non-linear time loop. Failsafe, what exactly happened here? The Cade 6 attempted to manipulate the Vex portal system. He is now trapped in a non-linear loop. In my defense, I tried to warn him. His leg. Not that smart. 
This mission is mostly an exploration of Nessus. Seeing the sunken cavern was always a highlight though, and Bungie's Skybox team is still leading in the industry for a reason. Once through the cavern, you're into the Well of the Giants, and need to kill more Vex to free Cade from his time loop. Maybe that's why Cade is so different in this game. It's a different Cade, from a different universe. That's how I'm going to convince myself to be happy with Red War Cade. Alright? After a square off with a Hydra, you free Cade. Quick, hurry, come on. I don't know how long this portal's going to stick. Cade? What have you- Stop, 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 stop. Look, look. Long story, and it may look like I don't know what I'm doing, but I do. Maybe not. It doesn't matter. Killing the power source at the origin point should break the loop and get me out of the portal system. Have you got that? Say you've got it. See something! Fine, I'll say it. We got it, Kate. Now, how did you- Oh, my cotton socks! Did you not hear what I just said? I'm guessing this is why they don't like him leaving the tower. Next mission, and this time, we are going to free Cade once and for all. In this mission, we meet fanatics that were really only a part of the Vault of Glass in Destiny 1, to my knowledge. But they have become a more frequent enemy in Destiny 2. One small change that made for a large difference in Destiny 2 was making some enemies spawn with elemental shields that deal additional damage on matching elements. So for example, if a Minotaur has a Void Shield and you use a Void Weapon, it would pop for an additional explosive damage, a small change that stuns and dealt more damage overall, making some enemies easier to fight and deal with, but it mostly rewarded your exploration of builds to fight. You grab the Reactor Core and free Cade, run for what feels like an eternity, and fight a giant Minotaur which always appears in the Exodus Crash Strike. I always wondered why this Minotaur was always here, and now it makes sense that it's defaulted to spawn there. I still don't know why it's defaulted to spawn here, no matter what. After this journey, you finally meet Failsafe herself in the Exodus Black, after a square off with a captain, who drops his Scorch Cannon on a kill. Hey, hey, down, down, down. So it's true. The light found its way back to you. Not that I'm jealous or nothing, but <laughs> take it easy out there, will you? You're making me look bad. What, may we ask, were you going to do with a Vex teleporter? Get up close and personal and go. Put a bullet in his head. Then maybe eat a sandwich. I gotta work out a few kinks first. Fun fact about the Vex tech. Not as intuitive as you'd think. Cade, you can't do this alone. <clears throat> Hell, I can't. <sighs> Even if you manage to kill Gaul, when the Red Legion leave a system, defeat or victory, they leave nothing behind. The Cabal are bad guys who do bad things. Yes, I get it. I'm sorry, but I do not think you do. The Cabal literally leave nothing behind. They have a weapon that can destroy a star, and it is pointed directly at our sun. Hey, 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 easy, easy. You're gonna blow a bolt. <laughs> Zavala has a plan. He needs you, Kate. Yes, well, Zavala always says he has a plan, but sometimes he just... Wait. Zavala said he needs me? As in, you heard those exact words coming out of Zavala's mouth? Yes, we did. Please tell me you recorded it. Well, did Akora at least hear it? Actually, Zavala lost her after the city fell. We don't know where she is. Io. Io, it's, it's where she'd go to look for answers. Hey, um... Thanks. Oh, you are. So, Nessus might have the least expanded location in the campaign. It would have a ton to cover in the overall game, but for the campaign, it seemed that the Cade storyline was forced to give a reason to be here. Anyways, we head to our final brand new destination, Io, a moon of Jupiter, but not the last moon of Jupiter we'd visit in Destiny's history. If Nessus was a combination of EDZ and Titan, then Io was more of a sequel to Destiny 1's Venus.
Finally, it feels that we're back to the Red Legion plotline, since right when you finish your conversation with Ikora, the Legion's armies storm in. This is also the theme of death coming back to fruition. All these years, dying, being reborn, dying again. The Traveler has left me with one life, and I am afraid to lose it. That might happen anyway. Gaul has a weapon that can blow up our sun. What? Why would he destroy what he's worked so hard to conquer? Get into that base. There must be answers there. The mission is all about seeking answers as to why Gaul would destroy our sun with the Almighty. As you venture through Io, you find that there is one more faction of enemy that we haven't discussed. What's wrong? Taken rips. Defensive wards, too. The Taken. The Taken are a lot easier to deal with in Destiny 2. I suppose it's because in Destiny 1, they were a DLC enemy faction for players who may already be familiar with Destiny's playstyle. But in Destiny 2, I have to say they are not the same threat overall. Still difficult in the right setting, but not a step up the way they were. You might question how the Taken are back, and Ikora simply says, Why are the Taken here? They have no leader. Oryx is dead. The Taken will always be drawn to the Traveler's energy. They are no longer Fallen or Hive or Cabal. Oryx changed them with the dark powers he stole. He... Wait, is Gaul's plan to do the same, but with the light? It seems out of character for Gaul to want to be immortal with light after overthrowing a leader for selfishness and gluttony. He seemed to be a well-tempered leader, but the character has to have his faults for the story to work, so I get the decision. After fighting through waves of Taken, you meet another brand new NPC. Everyone's favorite, Asher Mirror. Oh. You destroy Taken wizards to stop them from making a portal of some kind, and then kill a Taken Centurion to proceed. Portal's closed. We're clear. Ikora, I know this place is important to you, but... There's nothing for me here on Io. I have one life left to give, and I will give it gladly to stop Gaul. We leave now. After the square off, it's time to talk to Asher and reap the rewards. In this case, an exotic weapon of your choosing. Sunshot, Graviton Lance, or Risk Runner. This is when you could go back to the Haunted Forest to pick up another super ability, and I loved how these missions were done. Sure, it was go to the Haunted Forest, but this time you have guiding visions telling you why the supers mattered so much. These decisions add logos to the light, and the cutscenes are evidence to paint this picture. Now of course we have more missions, and this next one, Fury, involves the introduction of a later plotline involving the Warmind Rasputin. In this footage, I couldn't help but notice that Graviton Lance sounded way different than the one we have today. Super random, but I figured it worth mentioning. Even a small change like this goes to show how much different Destiny in 2017 was to now. You fight Vex for power control of the drill, and then the Taken deeper into it, returning to the drill site to fight the Vex and the Taken. What I can appreciate is that the set piece of the drill actually does open a path for us to see the Warmind. Once down into the depths, we're squared off against a giant Taken Minotaur, and I can remember this fight being really difficult, since we were not the monsters we are now in Destiny. Base gear meant enemies were a real threat. Ikora ends with this line. If Savala blows up the Almighty, it'll take the sun with it. It's time I rejoined my fire team. Tell me again, speaker. What makes your guardians worthy of the light? What is the price of such power and immortality? Devotion, self-sacrifice, death. Death. Explain. 
Devotion inspires bravery. Bravery inspires sacrifice. Sacrifice leads to death. So, feel free to kill yourself. I was born an outcast. Molded by it. As is custom with the Cabal, I was cast aside and left for dead. I was taken in by an old scholar himself disgraced, who saw in me something redeemable. He raised me, taught me, trained me, and in return, I would become a vehicle for his revenge. Okay, I was joking before about the Bane thing, but this is literally Bane. Against an empire that failed him, that failed itself. Rejection, ridicule, torment. It made me stronger. I gave everything to win, not just acceptance, but glory. Beneath my mask, Sticker, is the face of devotion and sacrifice. I will not take the light by force. To do so would be to admit failure. And I never fail. I see now. I see all that you have done. Our operation on the Jovian moon was a success. Once the cage is complete, we will have everything we need to begin the process of extracting the light. Dominus, everything we've worked for is here, for the taking. All that remains is your word. No, this is not the way, old friend. But it is the way, the only way. Not for me. I love how the speaker echoes the lines he said in Destiny 1's release. So really what you're saying is, we're damned if we do, damned if we don't. On the contrary, now that we are together again, we just might stand a chance. The fact is, if we destroy that weapon, we will ignite a chain reaction that could send our son into a supernova. Well, at least we have each other. Indeed. Look, I still have that Vex teleporter. It's got a limited range, so we'll have to get a little too close for comfort. Then we get inside the city walls for it to be effective. But without the light, an outright assault on the wall is doomed to fail. We could... There will be no coming back. It's worth it. How do we get in? You know... The city wall is kind of like this bar. Plenty of places to slip in unseen, so long as you know how. You sure you're not one of my hunters? <laughs> not really into capes. Clearly. Nice poncho. Once upon a time, that big white ball in the sky was there for all of us. I think it's about time we return the favor. Guardians or not. If we can't destroy the Almighty, we'll have to disable its weapon. And that means getting a certain Guardian on board. We'll need a good disguise if we're going to fly right through a Cabal Armada. If it's a Cabal ship you need, there's a base nearby full of them. But it won't be easy sneaking in. Oh, we're done sneaking. If there's one thing I've learned from Cade, it's the value of a grand entrance. This is great. Anyone want a hug? Hugs? No? Not. Tess then has a couple of care packages with mods. Those consumable shaders. Can't imagine how that will go for her. The next mission is Playback, a return assault on the Red Legion. But you also have the choice to do the Vanguard quest for unlocking the world. Cade's was to unlock patrols. 
but he also had a vendor screen containing caches that were marked treasures to gear up with. Zavala had a quest to partake in strikes, and Ikora had challenges. I had forgotten about challenges, but they're akin to bounties but built into activities as a sort of side objective. I'm not sure why I forgot about these, I actually really like the idea of most of them. And I think with the right incentive, these could have been a great return. One thing I should mention about Destiny's campaign is that there was a choice to not allow players to replay the Red War. In Destiny 1, there was always the option to replay missions whenever looking at the destination screens, even being able to select the harder difficulty. In Destiny 2, and maybe for clutter's sake, to save space on hard drives, I have no clue why, the campaign was removed after you beat it. The extra incentives from the vendors were not only to increase the health of the game, but also to give you reasons to level up to 15 so you could play Payback. In Payback, you storm the Red Legion's underground base in the EDZ and steal a tank that you can actually shoot with this time. The addition of new vehicles was something heavily requested in Destiny 1, and Bungie's experience making tanks in Halo was on full display for Destiny 2. I don't think Bungie could have predicted that people would find some really broken tech with these random tanks and desync, but these were pretty great. You have a main attack and micro missiles to lock on with. The satisfaction of finally being able to take down a ship came from destroying a thrasher with a tank, but this mission is really a long vehicle mission and the death site of Amanda Holiday in Lightfall. So you destroy the shields to get into the ship that can send you to the Almighty. And that's it for this one. Unbroken was up next. Your target is Thumos the Unbroken, one of Gaul's chosen. The key codes to his ship are your ticket to the Almighty. Hawthorne had a run-in with him while you were off planet. They're known as the Blood Guard for a reason. I tell you to be careful, but that didn't help the last team I sent out. Okay, the Blood Guard. That sounds fierce and different. This mission is more of what I enjoyed from the Red War. Narrow corridors and tight halls to fight. You break into the ship further and confront a new enemy, a Cabal Incendior. The most frustrating enemy that the Cabal have ever created. And yes, I'm aware phalanxes exist. These guys are equipped with flamethrowers. They can boop you. And if you shoot their pack when they die, they explode killing everyone, including you, if you're nearby. After taking down a ton of Cabal security in the room that looks very familiar to the Presage ship bay, released in 2021, Amanda Holiday starts shooting them down. What the f***? That's awesome. You fight onward and into a pretty basic fight against Thumos the Unbroken. I did find it funny that the objective says to break Thumos. Good one, Bungie. Thumos is dead. Check and check. Excellent work. Now get to the base, find his ship, and get to the Almighty. We're counting on you. Next mission. Larceny. Steal the no longer unbroken Thumos' ship and travel to the Almighty. This mission is pretty boring, so I'll skip a lot of it and just say that the ending introduces us to a new Cabal enemy called the Gladiator, a melee and tanky Cabal who will ruin your life if you let him get near you. Again, every faction has something new. Except the Taken, really. They got nerfed. By the end, you blast off to the Almighty. Zavala's troops are already getting into position around the city. But they can't attack until we shut this thing down. So, ready when you are, partner. New mission, and this one is a jam. This mission has layers of great stuff going on. Like not only a new destination for the mission, but there's some hidden storyline as foreshadowing. At the time, we had no clue, but Callus's shadows were already ahead of us and stowed away in secret of the ship. A really great attention to detail, I know some developers snuck in to the final release. This mission has us traveling to the Almighty, 
for all of its secrets and weaknesses. And it's here that we learn that the Almighty is consuming planets to use as fuel for destroying planets. It seems like a little bit of an engineering nightmare, but sure, why not? I'll roll with it. You put a charge into the mineral processing unit, then head off into the mission's main great set piece. Close to the sun, you need to stay in the shadows of the Almighty to prevent damage. It reminded me of the scene in Riddick, when Vin Diesel pours water on himself to traverse the heat. This was a very cool section that didn't overstay its welcome, and I think the campaign does a great job of this in general, even if a lot of the campaign was a vessel to tour the planets and the skyboxes. Yes, you are headed up those Kabbalian tubes and shot right through the weapon core. You steal an interceptor and take down the Almighty from destroying our universe. I'm bringing the ship around! Run! That's a good job, Colonel. What's that now? Seven in a row? Yeah, who needs the light when you got a fine feathered friend by your side? Am I right? Am I right or am I right? I'm right. Okay. Yeah, that's the rally point where I'll set up the teleporter. Zavala and Akora should be at their marks by now. Zavala, we're in position. As are we. Akora, ready when you are. Copy. Fire in the hole. Guardians falling down all the time. Where's Kate? And if he's sticking to the plan, he's right where he needs to be. Now we just gotta get you and Ikora up there with him. Well, this changes things. I'll work on this. You need to get moving. Ikora, Cade is in place and I'm en route. Good luck, Guardian. Cool. 
The enemy attacks the city, and the Almighty is lost. Lost? Explain yourself. Laid waste by the very same Guardian that somehow managed to reclaim its power, and has been humiliating our forces throughout this cursed system. You would know this if you hadn't been wasting your time communing with a machine and the creature who claims to speak with Take care of your tone, Consul. My tone? Huh. We will fail in our mission to secure this power and deliver our people. For the first time in the glorious history of the Red Legion, fail! Look at your traveler, Dominus! The cage is complete. The time is now. Claim what is rightfully yours and take this power! Tell me, Speaker, what more does the Traveler want of me? Go. I speak for the Traveler. I never said it spoke to me. This fixation is over! You have already been chosen, not by some inert machine, but by me! I chose you the day I found you! Remember who you are, what you are. You are Kamal. Kamal, wait for nothing. You will take the light. Do what you swore and give me the vengeance you promised! Look at me, student. Look at me! Last chance to look at me, actor. I will do what I swore, old friend. I am Gaul, and I will take the light. Chosen begins in the last city, one final battle to take back the Traveler and put an end to Gaul. One aspect often forgotten in this mission is that the assault on the Red Legion through the last city is a patrol area, meaning that the other fire teams help you on your assault. It is great. This was a pretty fantastic mission as well. You fought through the city and on rooftops. I know this is an odd thing to consider, but most of these types of stories rarely give you the sense of scale that a war would have. But this mission puts you right into the scene. Then, uh, this happens. Guardian, we can't make the jump. It's all on you now. Save the Traveler. A working, probably stable vex gate. One step and you'll be right next to the big guy. Go, or the Vanguard. And the Traveler. Make it matter. Oh. So I must have missed when the Vex teleporter was just able to get us right in the command ship, but we're on Gaul's ship now. The speaker is dead, and the console is uh, maybe dead? I don't know if either of them are really dead. I can't really tell from this. The game is rated T for teen, so I guess they couldn't show him dead dead. There's also these sleeping war beasts. And now, it's time to fight Gaul. Fitting your traveler would send you to face me once more. Look upon me. Dominus of the Red Legion. Annihilator of sons. Razor of a thousand worlds! Slayer of gods and conqueror of the light! I am gone! And I have become legend. Full stop, this is a great fight with Gaul, using Solar Arc and Void to fight against us something the Witch Queen would shamelessly steal in 2022. The scale of the fight is perfect, as is the small amounts of cover you find throughout. What's great is the pockets of light you find. 
giving you a small clue that the Traveler might be breaking free from Gaul's grips, and that he didn't understand the light after all. The only thing I can say is that because the story probably hit the end of its predicted runtime, Gaul fell a little flat for me by the end. It's like he went from a very cool, calm and collected leader to an angry tyrant in an instant. But I'd be a little salty if my plans failed too, so it's not the biggest deal in the world. After a very long fight, th this happens. Okay, so Gaul is the Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters. Got it. I didn't really understand this. I know Gaul is absorbing the light to be accepted, and the Traveler doesn't accept him, so he stays dead. But how did the Traveler just break free? Why now? Were you able to do this the whole time? And you gave us the perception there was more here? Why did Gaul even resurrect to begin with? It's cool, but when you think about it past surface level... There's a lot that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Before we move on, I gotta do this at least once. We ditch the farm and have our final powwow in the new Destiny 2 tower while the old one gets rebuilt. Try to trap it, but the light will find its way.
we won't see another pyramid ship for two more years. The bluest of Destiny 2's balls. I want to leave an overall review of the campaign here. So it started off pitch perfect for the story. Rebuild, reassess, value life, meet new characters. But Titan and Nessus especially were the weak points only because the game had to juggle so much in that time. That being said, I would say this campaign was the best Destiny ever had. Beating out the Taken King, even if two destinations felt a little forced to be in the campaign. Gaul was the first in-game compelling villain, so it's sad that he wasn't the raid boss. But there were plenty of teases about the raid and the campaign to that point. Overall, I would say good, but a lot of room for improvement to keep it focused. For those other stories that felt rushed, the best place to check in on them was in the adventures. These were side missions that had so much life that you'd be right to think they were leftover missions. Bungie really wanted everyone to do these adventures too, as there were exotic weapons tied to doing these. This was fine to me because Bungie had pivoted away from RNG exotics for quests anyways, and at least these adventures could be seen as quests. So we are moving on from the Red War campaign, and we are now beginning the side content of Destiny 2. There was no shortage of content to play at release of Destiny 2, outside of the campaign. A lot of these live service Destiny killers these days come out with a campaign, but a very shallow depth of variety in the content outside of it. Most recently, Suicide Squad, a video I can't stop talking about for some reason, discussed the confidently misplaced game loop of Rocksteady's live service, and how the end game and side activities boiled down to the same five objectives feeling more akin to a Destiny public event. Bungie thought public events were a great idea in vanilla Destiny 2 as well, since most of the game's exotics are going to come from these. You could get them from other places, but they had the same drop rate from public events, which is very disappointing. Tons of public events were added to this department. From shooting Taken Blights and Fallen Aether defense to shooting a large servitor, but Bungie innovated on the public event formula, and hid some optional objectives for higher rewards if you were intent on observation. Some were easy, like the Aether Protection, just break the extra generator three times. Others were a little more complicated, like the Taken Blight public event, to the point where it was a meme that this public event was RNG. Either way, this created a higher investment, higher reward system for all of these. But the loot was too good to the point where everyone was doing public events more than the actual endgame and side content, and you can't blame them either. If the loot is all there, players are going to be there too. Coincide this with the fact that legendaries had static roles on perks, much like exotics, and you could see why players pinned this game as shallow. But that wasn't really the case. See, the systems might let you believe that, but Bungie came out the gate of Destiny 2's launch with six strikes, and more on the way with the DLC Curse of Osiris and Warmind to follow. Not all of these remain in Destiny 2, like the Io Strike, the Pyramidian, and my personal favorite strike from Destiny 2, Savathun's Song. And it's not like these strikes were half-baked either. Savathun's Song had the player taking different routes on the course to the boss every time you loaded in. The Inverted Spire may have had this bug. But it was a multi-stage boss fight, each with their own mechanic to the fight. Lake of Shadows was a PlayStation exclusive strike, but easily one of the most memorable for the speedruns. The Arms Dealer was a classic Destiny 1 strike through and through, with a mini boss, then a great showdown of the main boss. And the Pyramidian was against this large hobgoblin in an arena with little to no cover, making it a very tricky nightfall. Then there's Exodus Crash. It wasn't that bad, but the boss room was an absolute nightmare in Nightfalls. But again, when the rewards were so heavily discovered in heroic public events, and you only needed to find a legendary once to own it forever, these side activities fell flat. It's a fragile pulley system, and the lever was held together by the diehard Destiny fandom, speaking as the glue. That's the thing, right? Great story for what Destiny had accomplished to this point. Solid strikes, a more fleshed out public event activity, plenty of loot to chase, but systems that were reactionary 
to the most popular games in Activision's catalog. Destiny 1 was always innovating, but Destiny 2 was now reacting to what was trendy instead of just saying, Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Adventures were a nice nod to doing their own thing. And it's safe to say that Bungie's worlds of stories merged together better than they ever had before. You might find yourself fighting the Red War, but then you're discovering what the Warmind is. You're having a meeting with the Fallen without taking up arms. Adventures made Destiny 2 almost lifelike. Because yeah, we might be fighting a war, but it doesn't mean these locations didn't already have history and new conflicts arising. Bungie understood that they needed the player who cared about Destiny 2 to engage with the adventures, so they put specific exotic weapons behind completing their quests. The EDZ, for example, contained no exotic for completing its adventures, but it would kick off a quest. Let's not get it twisted, however. The Mita Mini tool was a very strong weapon. Even if SMGs at release were not very good, this weapon has been remade into the Callus Mini tool, which is one of the best SMGs in all of Destiny 2's history. But at the time, it was the Mita and it came from a long quest involving completing all of the adventures with the Fallen, as they were using Cabal Tech to extract more ether. After 13 adventures and a visit to Devrim, the Mita multi-tool was up for grabs. I think the EDZ had the least compelling adventure quests just because the Fallen had no real face of leadership and weren't driven by mystery the way the Vex were, but this was still a good time. I will say that the Mita multi-tool was one of the best crucible weapons by the end of Destiny 1, so this quest being as long as it was made sense. And in classic Destiny fashion, getting the exotic involved dismantling rare and legendary scout rifles, getting a ton of kills with scouts and SMGs, and for some reason airborne SMG kills. After this was all done, you could claim the exotic, and some people aren't really a fan of these lengthy quests but I think they're necessary to keep the exotic name to these weapons. Otherwise, you're just buying them from the tower and they lose all meat. Oh. Titan Adventures were easily my favorite and offered the exotic weapon Rat King by the end of it all. The enemy of my enemy storyline dealt with the Fallen and the Hive, but something felt different with this encounter, especially with the Fallen. Who is this Fallen, you may wonder? Well, Destiny players would know him today as Mithrax, now a major character who created the House of Light. But Mithrax was also our assistant in the Zero Hour mission, a little over a year after this adventure in the Red War storyline. Throughout this set of adventures, it is heavily implied that Mithrax doesn't want to kill you, and even traps you for a brief time in a chamber so he can escape from you. When most, if not all Fallen would choose to try their hand at killing you, by the end, Mithrax is fighting a knight, and you can take them both out, or just the knight. Actually, if you wanted to do the Zero Hour mission in Forsaken, you better let Mithrax live. He even says something that I don't understand before he exits. Subscribe. After this ordeal, you get the Rat King's riddles to solve. And looking back on this, I really appreciate the nods to folklore in these riddles. First puzzle up, quote, The Rat King's crew runs to and fro. Good girls and boys, nowhere to go. Pick up your toys and darn your socks. On errands of woe, on errands we walk. Don't think too hard on this riddle. All you needed to pay attention to was some of the wording and think about what destiny has involved running to and fro errands of woe. If you guessed that it was just do three patrol missions, then you were correct. But the twist is that at least one other doing a patrol and for all steps involving this quest, they needed the Rat King or the quest for Rat King staying true to the idea of the Rat King working together. Next step, quote, the Rat King's crew goes arm in arm to fight as one to do no harm. So you have your fun and run outside, rally the flag and will never die. Rally the flag was the hint for step two and rally flags weren't in anything but public events at the time, not even raids. So complete two of these, quote, the Rat King's crew goes four and four with good, good fights they learn to score, then three as one stand up right, return from past the wall and wanting more. I should mention that PvP was in a 4v4 arrangement for all modes, and not 6v6, to once again claw closer to a more balanced, esports ready vision of Destiny, 
Another reactionary change. All of the 15 Crucible maps released with Red War, yes, 15, were developed for a 4v4 style. And while the eventual change to 6v6 was welcomed, Crucible maps can sometimes feel too crowded in a 6v6 simply for this fact. The Crucible was your next step in the Rat King's quest, and just completing two matches with your Rat King friends would advance this. Quote, The Rat King's crew stands three as one. They see night's fall and fear it none, but gather close with squeaking friends, lest lonely rats meet violent ends. The final step was to complete a nightfall with five minutes or more remaining. That's right, remaining. You might wonder how nightfalls differ back in Vanilla Destiny 2, and they really were different. So different in fact that I'd be fooling myself if I didn't want this format of Nightfall back in some way. No sitting around and waiting for a long run to complete. You add time by killing enemies. The more time, the higher the reward. There were usually some interesting modifiers too, like Prism, a modifier that made it so Arc, Solar, and Void Burns rotated, so you had to prepare accordingly. There were even rings to add time to your run, these were risk-reward because if you stepped out to grab them, chances were you'd be on the ground begging for a revive. The final one was anomalies, basically energy charges you could shoot to extend the time as well. I know a lot of people complained about nightfalls this way because they were too punishing and not the classic Destiny 1 experience, but I really liked the push for innovation and new ideas here, even if all of them didn't land. You could tell that Destiny 2 was still made with a lot of passion from the developers. Most people were not going to get this final step done until week 2 or 3, but once you acquired the Rat King, it was not bad, but not great either. See, this weapon had one of the most unique exotic perks of all time, upping the rate of fire immensely if your whole team was full of rats. It basically required the class ability Rally Barricade from Titans and Auto Reloading, but it had its applications back then. Nowadays, the rats are waiting for a comeback. The Nessus Adventures starts off with a step to get Drang, in a quest called Oh Captain My Captain, in which we follow Failsafe's old dead crew members' audio logs and learn about their adventures through Nessus. We can hear it sounded almost like the plot of Prometheus, but the difference here is that we already know what the Vex look like, so hearing about these alien creatures doesn't hit the same as if it were a new major enemy at the end of the chain. I need to stop myself from doing Rat King rhymes. By the end, there is a great twist though, with the harpies sent by the captain to escort us, so we've met a friendly fallen captain, and now a hacked harpy escorting us. By the end of this, you get Drang, a solar sidearm that would pair incredibly nice with the exotic from this very same questline. For the exotic, it wasn't as pretty. Nessus Exotic Adventure was more focused on teasing the raid, which I really appreciate. Callus was teased so many times from the story in cutscenes and gameplay to these adventures and the suspicious sweeper bot. I always loved how Destiny teased raids in some way. It was subtle, but an introduction to an activity that only very few would engage in. The exotic portion of this quest involved Callus level abundance of loot, decoding five legendary engrams and one exotic engram. So basically what I'm saying is do some public events. You would also partake in kills with Drang and do more public events. Do a strike, then kill a specific enemy in the Exodus Crash Strike named Kendrix, who I believe is still in the game. I need to confirm it for myself though, and I'll leave something on the screen if he's here or not. Then Sturm was yours for the taking. Sturm has come alive in the Crucible metas as of recently, and was a very unique exotic but you were always better off by having Drang with it. And I'm not sure if I can speak for everybody, but I don't think it made the major splash in the Crucible the way Bungie would have hoped for. But I can appreciate the charm for it. This is a slow rate of fire hand cannon that gains more damage if you get kills with Drang. And Sturm makes energy weapons refill from reserve on kills. Charming for Crucible, but not much else. I hope by going through these adventures and quests, you can see that there was a heavy emphasis on expanding the world while rewarding the player. It was easy to check these off as purely a checklist or a quota of quests for exotics to fill the content. But there was new ideas expressed in a lot of these, potential plot lines, foreshadowing, and let's be honest, getting exotics like this beats grabbing them from a wall or a lost sector. The final one up was Io, which didn't have an exotic weapon for some reason. 
Maybe it's because Asher gave an exotic weapon of choice in the campaign, or Bungie wanted more of these to be found through RNG like Destiny 1. Either way, it was an odd decision given the consistency before. This quest kicks off with the Taken, and the idea of the post Oryx Taken world. The mainstays are here, with more foreshadowing. We see Coria's name, we reach the top of the Pyramidian to destroy ur Arak's Taken portal. The reward was the first legendary linear fusion rifle, called the Mano War. And these archetypes were really bad for a long time, so while it's cool, it was not good in the beginning. Well, that about wraps it up for the side content of the game, but there was a lot of great additions that weren't fully realized, like Hawthorne and clans. You just never quit, do you? Took out Gaul? Up the traveler, and now Hawthorne here on the street is how much you and your clan are making a difference. And that's why I started this whole clan thing in the first place. Aside from hearing the same lines every week, clans were supposed to be a very large portion of Destiny 2. Since Destiny 1 made you go through the Bungie website and was a hassle to set up, but I would be lying if I said clans were so much better in Destiny 2. What could have been a great system of cosmetics and clan wars turned into a checklist for a few more legendaries. Another system that was supposed to work with this was guided games. Clans helping clanless players complete raids and nightfalls. But the guided game system was very bad, to the point where if someone's internet went out and disconnected, they couldn't join back and would be penalized. If the rest of you also backed out, you'd be penalized too. This system was so flawed that the emblem for being a guided games player was the same emblem as the one for guiding 50 players through. Yeah, it wasn't great. Eventually, Bungie would lean a bit harder into a clan-like structure with faction rallies, something that we may never see again. I want to make a video on factions as a whole one day, but these rallies were Dead Orbit, New Monarchy, and Future War Cult competing for players to complete activities. It boiled down to earning tokens from public events adventures, and patrols. But the factions were filled with cosmetics, and that alone might have made them worth playing for the player base. That leaves us with Crucible, The Raid, and Trials of the Nine. Crucible, I feel like you get the gist of at this point, but one thing I should mention is that it was just quick play. Yeah, all of the modes blended into quick play, and then when Iron Banner came around, it was just the token system with quick play as well. There was just Iron Banner, Trials of the Nine was the competitive 4v4 elimination style game mode. Or was it? See, Trials of the Nine was just objective modes like Countdown, which was trying to emulate a mode like Counter-Strike. But it wasn't received all that well, at least in the playstyle. The area to get the rewards for Trials of the Nine was fantastic, and expanded the Nine past Xur. Again, great world building. But between Star Horse, the Emissary, and flying around another beautiful sandbox, there wasn't a lot going on in this mode. Eventually, Bungie would remove Trials of the Nine and introduce Competitive Crucible, with plenty of Pinnacle rewards. To then remove Pinnacle weapons and reintroduce Trials of Osiris in Shadowkeep. So basically what I'm saying is that Crucible has had a tough lifespan since Destiny 2. But if you watched my channel for a long time, you know I love my raids and the moments they create. So let's talk about Kallus, the Leviathan, and the outcome of a raid that was a teaser. The Leviathan released shortly after Red War, with Day One Raiders antsy at the idea of being first in the world to complete Bungie's best activity. There was no belt or Day One emblem, just the loot and the satisfaction of saying first. Leviathan held the same Destiny standard of introducing a location for a raid so alien from the rest of the game. If Destiny the game had a flow state of what to expect, then the raids were like a tornado, sweeping you to the yellow brick road. In this case, the golden road of the loyalist to Kallus. Leviathan was a bunch of tests from Kallus to the player, and the raid was received very well at release by the player base. But a lot of people weren't happy with the conclusion. I am not finishing it. It is just not worth it to me. So when you beat a boss, you don't get loot. You get a key. Yeah. And then you have to go through all the tunnels of the underbelly of the Leviathan to find a loot chest to actually get loot. Yay. Oh my god. Yeah, really? a legendary oh fucking engram!
I think having foreshadowing was a good idea in a lot of these adventures, but Gaul not being the raid boss paired with a callous fake out was not going to win people over. The mechanics in this raid were also not my personal favorite, but I can appreciate the attempt to innovate on raids. For example, raids were always about a more linear path to the final boss. Callus and the Leviathan had an entire world flowing through the interconnected ship that you could find your own path to the next encounter. Now there was only one real boss fight, and I think that's why I personally didn't prefer the raid, but you cannot deny they put a lot of care into this. This was when the pre-order exotic Coldheart was going to become your best friend. Leviathan would also introduce a prestige mode with extra layers of mechanics and twists, which was a nice layer of additions for cosmetics. This would be the last time Destiny 2 would ever do the prestige raids this way. And the last year, prestige raids existed altogether. The decision to remove the difficulty will always be up for debate, but the master modes have tried to remedy some of this. Even if they're not the same reward tiers and they're not really adding mechanics other than champions, but that's for another video. By the end of day one, the legend himself clan claimed worlds first on Leviathan. There was a quest for the exotic shotgun, the legend of Acrius. This quest started after completing the Red War campaign and would continue on into one of the hardest nightfalls ever. Nowadays, it might be an appreciated challenge, but back then, even seeing somebody have this exotic was the talk of the town. The place to continue this quest and grabbing all of the raid loot was from Benedict 99, the sweeper bot. Hey buddy, did you blow up the tower's defenses? Between picking up all of the loot and engaging in the quest, this was it for the Red War. The next step for players was to collect all of the static world weapons, the cosmetics, the exotics, and wait for Curse of Osiris. The answer to the mystery around Osiris. But we'll save that for the next video in this series. Now it's important that we discuss the fall of Destiny 2, because while I just went into great detail for a long time about the game, once the honeymoon period ended, the player base dropped off a cliff and was left bitter rather than excited for the future. There's something to be said when a sequel to the most successful live service console game of all time has this much content in its debut, yet no depth to speak of. What Bungie's developers aimed to reach for just didn't work in a game where business dictated the necessity of trends. The most popular and successful hero shooter of all time released one year prior to Destiny 2, and Overwatch was finding its way into Activision games all over. This wasn't just the case with Destiny 2, but look at Call of Duty. Black Ops 3 had some operators with super abilities, even a Titan Slam looking like Destiny's. Destiny was seen as a palette by the people with the intent of only seeing the hues of green. Overwatch had become so successful that Overwatch League was being established, and whoever was in charge of this saw it as a golden opportunity to paint Destiny 2 in the image of Overwatch, looking at the data without actually reading it. Rip away the randomness of perks on weapons to encourage balance and replayability in the Crucible. Nerf the timers on abilities, movement speed, and super abilities to focus on gunplay and encourage a blend of tactical shooting with hero play. No special weapons. Mold them to heavy weapons since they're too strong for a competitive scene and would rip apart balance. Who better than the company that invent competitive gaming in ranked systems to test this idea on. All of this, and there wasn't even a real attempt at an esports scene in Destiny. I know it's easy to say that the main driver was esports, when really only Soar and a few other orgs ever signed talent. Most of the events were in-house. We may never get answers to everything, but it's just as likely that the pursuit of balance was overseeing everything else, including the idea of esports in the game. Regardless, the simplification was no doubt the leading driver, for esports, or balance, or not. And this was in all parts to appeal to a casual audience. Trying to please everybody never works. The data of Destiny always showed that players were in public events and patrols the most, so making the content of the game revolve around a player who wants to play Destiny this way 
made the most sense for purely data. But that's seeing the data and not really reading it, right? It didn't take a professional to see why this would ultimately be a bad idea for Destiny in the long run. And the shining golden goose egg was rotting. Shortly after the hype of the raid, Iron Banner, and faction rallies, a storm of feedback videos, reviews, and player drop-off was conjuring catastrophic waves for Bungie. At least if it was a more traditional loot-based open world game, then they could get way more creative and wacky with the world, when they don't have to restrict design to having to work in PvE and PvP. It is so unbelievably dull in its current state. It is in my opinion that this rating drops back down to a 6 out of 10. You've remade Destiny! Congratulations! Most of us hoped for a bit more of its original promise. The consensus was that the Red War was really solid. But systematically, everything needed to change or Destiny would be doomed. With many reviews attributing the comparison to a ship taking a long time to correct course. And new Coke versus the same old Coke formula. Destiny much like Coke, is horrible for you. I hate Destiny, it's my favorite game. But that old Coke Destiny formula, it just tasted so much better. And due to these decisions, Destiny 2's new Coke formula was too expensive for people to want to try again. It may be the case that Destiny 2 has recovered a lot from Red War decisions, but those players who have left have not come back. The sentiment whenever somebody tries to even play Destiny will always be dead game. You know, and I know, it's not true. But Destiny went from the mass appeal in Destiny 1, a game players grew up with and really hold in high regard, to a Destiny 2 budding joke made any time a friend says they're a Destiny player. It didn't have to be like this, and I don't think the game ever fully recovered from the Red War era. Destiny would follow this up with its largest flop. The Curse of Osiris, and it wouldn't be for an entire year that Destiny would be on the path to recovery. So with all of that being said, was Red War really bad? Or was it held back by decisions that are separate from the content itself? The conclusion you can hopefully draw is that Red War was really solid, even innovative, and made by a passionate team that fundamentally was working within bad early development decisions. I hope you enjoy this video and can stay along with me on my journey. Consider supporting my Patreon and subscribe if you haven't already. If you're watching this, I'm also probably live right now on Twitch. Thank you guys, and I'll see you next time.